Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. The area was heavily wooded. We called them mountain, but they were more like hills. This was in McIntosh County in Oklahoma. The creature was standing in the middle of a gravel road on top of a hill about a hundred yards from a lake. The creature was large and hairy, long hair with no neck. I was building a deer stand overlooking a shell pit when it started getting dark. We carried the scrap wood back to our tractor and trailer, parked a short distance away on a gravel road, which led to our house and many others. We were parked on the top of the hill that leveled out at the top about 30 yards. As I loaded wood, I happened to look to my left, and there it was, standing in the road staring at us, with its arms slightly out from its side. From where I was standing, it had Lake Eufaula, as a backdrop, and I could see about two feet of hair covering it head to toe, blowing lightly in the breeze. At that time, my brother and I stood in amazement, arguing what this thing was. He said, don't you know what it is? And I said, yeah, that's a gorilla. That being the only logical animal that even slightly resembled what we were looking at. And my brother said, no, that's a Bigfoot. I proceeded to tell him there was no such thing, but I knew that this was no gorilla. It was just dark enough not to see facial features, but it was a perfect silhouette against the blue water. It was tall and stood upright. How tall? It's hard to say when you're scared to death. It had no neck to speak of, but lots of hair. We didn't hang around too long before we turned tail and ran. We came back later for our tractor and trailer. On to the next one. This was in McIntosh County in Oklahoma. It was a summer, moonlit night. My then-boyfriend and myself were standing outside after a date, saying our goodbyes and both leaning with our back toward his pickup truck. We were facing our pasture behind the house that I grew up in. We were talking quietly and not moving much. My parents have a propane tank, which is silver in color, and a 20 to 25 feet long that sits 50 yards behind their house. As we were both looking toward the pasture, we noticed something 7 to 8 feet tall running across the pasture. It became more visible as it ran in front of the propane tank and was running in an upright position. It was dark in color. It ran southwestward toward the tree line of the pasture, but distinctly we could see it turn and look at us as it ran. Simultaneously, my boyfriend and myself asked each other if we saw that and ran into the house, telling my mother. She grabbed a flashlight and shown it toward the pasture and saw nothing. It was nighttime, 10.30 p.m. It was a balmy evening and moonlit. There was a wooden area very nearby. There was a small creek bed located 20 yards from the incident. A nearby neighbor was deer hunting in the hill located a quarter of a mile from the incident and claimed to have seen something walking upright though near where she was hunting with her husband. She described a distinct smell and actually saw the hair color of the creature. This incident happened three or so years after my incident. On to the next one. In Tillman County in Oklahoma, the nearest main road was County Line Road. At the airport, it's been a while there are various access roads. I was 17. Me and my friend were going to the airport in Frederick, Oklahoma, in Tillman County. My friend's dad owned a helicopter manufacturing plant 
that was located at the airport a few miles south of town. We were going to get some paperwork for a trip we were taking during spring break. It was about 9 p.m. or later. It was dark. There is an access road that leads to the hangar, which is at the south end of the airport. I believe the field on the passenger side of the van, my side, was a plowed field. Me and my friend were talking, and I saw something out of my peripheral vision in my window. There are various lights scattered out there on buildings and such, but mostly very dark. At first, I thought it was a reflection from the inside of the van when I glanced. Then I turned my head to look, and there it was. I would say 15 to 20 yards directly to my right, striding at our speed. It seemed easily. I would guess it was 20 miles per hour. I would say maybe it was a bear or something else if it wasn't so clear to me what I was looking at. It looked just like the majority of pictures and clips I've seen of Bigfoot over the years, almost identical to the really popular one. And almost just like that clip, I was looking, trying to come to terms with what I'm looking at. While it is running, it turns its head and is looking at me. It had dark black hair. It seems to me the face was dark like the hair, but being dark is hard to say for sure. The whole face wasn't covered with hair. I could make out some features because I remember a kind of indifferent expression on its face as we were staring at each other. It had the same kind of gait as the video and seemed not to be labor to run as fast as he was. I could not even talk. My friend did not see it. We got to the hangar, which was about a quarter of a mile down the access road in the same direction it was going. That was when my friend knew I was serious. I would not get out of the van to go in to get the paperwork and told him that I'm going to leave him if I see the thing. We decided to come back the next day. The airport is very secluded, mostly flat fields, a couple of creeks with tree lines, but overall flat and open. But the Red River is only four or five miles away, and I could see him there, but I don't know why it would venture to where he was. I think I would rather have seen a UFO, the look you get when you say, I saw Bigfoot. It was about 9 or 9.30 p.m., sparse lighting scattered around. It seemed that it was fairly cool, maybe the low 50s. On to the next one. In McCurtain County in Oklahoma, at 6.30 p.m. in July, it was about seven feet tall. It had long, reddish hair. The hair on its arms hung down about six inches or more. There was another car in front of me. He walked behind that car to cross the road. When he did, he was right in front of me, took three steps, and he was crossed the road. I went back to see if I could see him, but he was gone. I saw him very well, and no man could step as far as he did in three steps. It was not at least seven feet tall, with long, reddish-brown hair. Its arms were very long, and he looked to be built very solid. The area was very thick, wooded big oak trees with swamp land about one mile from Little River on the little highway between Glover and Millerton. The highway crosses the river by a bridge called Golden Gate Bridge, like in California, but a lot smaller. He was about one mile from the south of the bridge, I've heard other stories about other people seeing him and hearing him, but maybe now other people from that area will come forward. On to the next one. On July 28, 1968, at St. Danilius de Cotza, the boards report that five children observe a sort of circle surrounded by a bright red halo. This anomaly was followed by a second one of the same sort, and then the first haloed circle landed in a nearby cornfield. Undaunted, the children took a flashlight and went out to see what they could see. 
their flashlight revealed to them a three and a half foot tall being with an ugly face with rough furrowed skin about 45 feet from their location. The children promptly ran back into the house in a panic and one of the boys reported seeing the creature looking through a window, knocking on the glass and making mooing sounds. Needless to say, the group stayed firmly indoors and shortly thereafter, they saw the UFO ascending slowly into the sky. The following day, the landing site was checked and a region of flattened oats was found in the area where the children indicated that the UFO had landed. On that same night in July, in Upton, an entire family observed a sparkling, rotating cloud in their garden, while several three-foot-tall beings chased cows around a nearby field. This event occurred about three hours after the previous episode. None of the witnesses got close enough to the beings to give an accurate description, but one has to wonder if the same creatures didn't pay a visit to this garden. The boards, in their typical intelligent style, note that where two sets of witnesses in the Quebec incident saw small humanoids exiting an anomalous aerial phenomenon, a third set observed a cloud in the vicinity of St. Bruno in late July. From this cloud stepped the Blessed Virgin Mary. Quebec is a strongly Roman Catholic region of the country. Like the tie-in with UFO and military in Atlantic Canada, one has to wonder if the intelligence behind these phenomena doesn't alter its appearance in accordance to the observer. An account of a 1969 UFO encounter in the village of Chapeau en de Lise de Allumette in the Ottawa River. Animals seem to be very alert to the presence of the anomalous. In this case, farmer Leo Paul Chapeau was roused from sleep by the frantic barking of his farm dog at about 2 a.m. on the 11th of May and noticed a brilliant light shining through one of the windows. He was astonished to see a dome-like object on the ground not more than 500 feet from the farmhouse. The craft was approximately 30 feet in width and vaguely resembling the military helmets worn by the French army during World War I. The craft seemed to vanish as a soft hum receded into the night. In the morning, the farmer investigated the area where he had seen the craft and found a large circular imprint that had not been there on the previous day. The imprint was 32 feet in diameter, and the marking bore dehydrated soil and vegetation. Throughout the area of effect, Chapeau also found other depressions in his field, and their depth suggested an object of considerable weight. A more modern UFO sighting occurred at an unlikely location, the heart of downtown Montreal, on the 7th of November, 1990, Susan Michaels report on a UFO that hovered over the Bonaventure Hotel for nearly three hours. This craft, described by some witnesses as a mothership, was observed by more than 100 people, including Montreal police officers, along with their director of operations, an officer from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, two airline pilots, three newspaper reporters, and several clinical psychologists attending a convention at the hotel. One of the first witnesses was Lynn St. Pierre, the lifeguard at the hotel's rooftop swimming pool. She described seeing several very bright yellow lights and noted the thing was over my head in every corner of the rooftop that she went to, to imply the lights were attached to something hovering over the hotel. The witness contacted the hotel manager who responded and the word that a UFO was hovering over the hotel spread like wildfire through the building, bringing guests and staff out onto the roof. The hotel security director contacted the local police, who then contacted the RCMP. RCMP constable Luke Morin responded 
and was dumbfounded. I've been a member of the RCMP for 19 years, and in my experience, I've seen a bit of everything, but I've never encountered anything like that UFO. Above the pool, I observed three shades of light. I stayed on the scene for approximately two hours and 15 minutes, and after a while, the lights began to move slowly from the west to the east. The RCMP constable and the local police tried to determine what the object was, calling the airport to check on the aircraft in the area and noting that it did not appear to be a light phenomena like the Aurora Borealis. The officers even worked together to get local construction sites to shut off all lights to ensure they were not seeing a reflection. The UFO remained stubbornly in place until a little after 2200 hours when heavy snow clouds rolled in and obscured the object. Despite a number of public and private sector investigations being launched into the mothership sighting, no conclusion was ever drawn about what the anomaly was, and it remains unidentified despite the best efforts of the RCMP, computer experts, and the National Research Council. What is clear from the investigators' contact with agencies like the Canadian Weather Services, now Environment Canada, is that this craft, which was calculated to be no less than 1,500 feet in diameter, did not appear on radar. It's also notable that Hydro-Quebec, the local power company, reported a power outage at one of its stations between 2240 and 2300 hours shortly after the UFO disappeared from view over the hotel. The outage was of interest since it only affected a 12,000-volt line that ran to a military base. Again, we have a UFO that seems to be interfering with operations involving a military base. It'd be interesting to know what sorts of activities went on at the affected base and whether there were nuclear weapons there. UFOologists in the U.S. have certainly noted the presence of UFOs in close proximity to nuclear weapons, storage, missile silos containing nuclear missiles, even nuclear power plants. There are confirmed reports of UFOs taking nuclear sites offline for a period of time. It seems reasonable to assume that the intelligence behind the UFO is concerned with, or at least curious, about human military and particularly nuclear capabilities. On to the next one. A few weeks ago, I heard a light knocking on my front door. My dogs were sleeping and I have insomnia, so I was wide awake. I was also home alone, which made me anxious to go through the roof. I went to the door and being the anxious teenager I am, peeked through the peephole to see two male children at my front door. They both looked around the age of 13. It did spook me quite a bit. I live on a private property with a gate that is almost always shut. I opened the door slightly so I could just peek out and look at them. They looked up at me and I could see their pitch black eyes with no eye white. I remember my dad telling me as a kid not to open the door for black-eyed kids, which caused me to research these children. I slammed the door on them, to which they started yelling that they wanted to have my permission to come inside. They started scratching and pounding on my door, and I ran around my house checking that every door and window was locked. After a few minutes, they left. I was wondering why exactly I had this experience and why it was me that it happened to. I've not felt any sort of changes to my body or any strange things since. I'm just dumbfounded as to why this happened. On to the next one. Around the end of April in 2015, I was in Oregon in the USA for work. I worked for a company that handled the customer service member privilege points of sales systems 
with Planet Fitness. I was there checking on a few locations. Since Planet Fitness is a 24-7 establishment, I had to cater to all the shifts that would show up to each club multiple times during the day and night. One night at approximately 11.30 p.m., I was heading to the gym located in Beaverton, Oregon. My rental car had Bluetooth capabilities and was currently playing a coast-to-coast AM episode through the car speakers about how the gin and the black-eyed kid phenomena were related. On reflection, that was a serious coincidence because what happened when I arrived at the club chilled me to the core. When I arrived at the club, I decided to smoke in the parking lot with the driver's side window open on my rental. This was so I could continue to listen to the episode and not be in the car. I didn't want a fine for smoking in a rented vehicle. The gym is inside an L-shaped strip mall. Planet Fitness is all the way to the far end. To the far left is a pharmacy. My passenger side was parallel to the Planet Fitness, and that was about 30 feet from a streetlight. The pharmacy was about 75 feet away and closed. I was leaning against the car, smoking and playing on my phone, I looked up at the pharmacy, and in the light of the marquee style sign, I could see two people standing outside. It was almost midnight. I thought, how weird was it to see people outside the closed pharmacy? But the thought was fleeting. After a few seconds, I looked up. I noticed the two people were kids and had moved closer. It struck me as odd as I didn't see them walking to that spot. They were just there, looking in my general direction. From this distance, I could tell both were wearing hooded sweatshirts. They were dark in color, and both kids had their hoods up. I glanced back up, and the kids were closer, about 25 feet away. They were once again outside the directory light glow, but I could see them much clearer. This time, their heads were aimed down. I couldn't see their faces, but I could make out their clothes. One had an olive, drab green hooded sweatshirt. The hoodie was up over the top of a gray ball cap, baggy blue jeans, and black low-top shoes. The other was dressed very similarly, wearing a navy blue zip-up hoodie and hood up over what looked like a black ball cap khaki pants, and white shoes. There was nothing to distinguish any brands on any article of the clothing. Their clothes were weird. They were too big, but not like kids wore in the 90s. Too big, like oversized, faded hand-me-downs. Everything they wore was dingy. The kids were standing still. I hadn't seen them move to their current location, and they were almost frozen there, not moving at all. I don't know how or why, but I just went back to my phone. I got a weird feeling almost instantly. I looked up, and they were five feet in front of me, not moving, just closer. I could tell by their physical build that the kids were both male and around 15 years old. Still at ease, I tossed the cigarette butt underneath the car and asked, What's going on, guys? Anything I can do for you? The response I got was probably the most awkward thing. Kid one, please, kind sir. Kid two, may we borrow a cigarette? Kid one, it's a very lonely night. Kid two, we only need one cigarette. Kid one, thank you. Kid two, please. After they finished speaking in unison, they slowly lifted their head to show me their faces. I remember thinking it's kind of late for teenagers to be out on a Thursday, and almost as if they plucked that from my head, Kid 2 replied, It's quite all right. We have permission. As soon as permission rolled off the second kid's lips, their faces were level with mine, showing me solid, jet-black eyes. I froze. My mind was going a million miles an hour, because damn it, I don't know what black-eyed kids are. Well, not what they are, but I know of them. I couldn't move or speak. Their faces were almost the definition of blank, almost because the edges around their slit, straight mouth began to curl ever so slightly, but you could see it. 
the inside of my stomach began to get colder, and with all my might, I tried to turn my face, but I couldn't. The second kid took a step forward. The movement of shoes caught my eye, and I broke eye contact. I looked down the moment the eye contact was broken. Everything I knew about black-eyed kid encounters rushed through my head. I turned around and ran into the club. Now when I say ran, I sprinted in loafers, and all six foot one, 250 pounds of me screamed the whole way. The young kids who worked at the counter just stared at me when I came in. I tried my best to explain, but they weren't cool enough to have heard about the black-eyed kids. I looked out of the plate glass in front and saw the two of them standing side by side facing the club. When I saw them, chills ran down my spine. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!